Uh, we're going to move now to our next panel, which is on applying these uh, approaches to analyzing international systems. We have, um, once again, the capable hands of Ben Carver as our moderator. We have uh, two panelists for this session. The first uh, is Ishan Vista. Ishan is currently a first year fellow at uh, the Cornell Institute for Public Affairs with a concentration in economic and financial policy. He's passionate about issues related to labor, employment, economic growth, and development. Our second panelist is Angel Ortega. Uh, he is a Fulbright scholar from Panama studying in the Cornell Institute for Public Affairs MPA program. He has a concentration in government, politics, and policy studies. He is a lawyer who graduated from the University of Panama and an alumni of the European George Marshall Center for Security Studies. So without further delay, we will start with Ishan. Good afternoon to all. I am Ishan Bista, and I'm going to present my analysis on the topic issues with development projects in Nepal. It's a case study of development projects in Nepal and its issues using the agent based approach. Now in the photos, you can see that these are some big infrastructure projects in Nepal. These are unique in itself. Well, because some are big hydropower projects, some are transmission lines, some are irrigation projects, some are airports, and some are fast track roads. But even though these projects are fundamentally different in nature, there is one thing that is very common in most of these projects. That one thing is something I would like to highlight over here. Now, you may think the commonalities, maybe with regards to the funding of the structure or maybe with how the projects are run, but the commonality that I would like to highlight here is that most of these projects are delayed, meaning that they pass over the due date of completion and they have cost overruns. To just give you an idea of this, to give you an example, the Melamchi drinking water project was introduced in around 1998 and a loan agreement for it was signed in around 2000. The project was aimed to be completed by 2007, but this project was only completed in 2021. So 23 years after its introduction, that's astounding. Now, why I chose love and projects is because I felt the need to look at the system from a different angle. As failures as such had been normalized, the same patterns repeated again and again. For anyone who is not involved in working in such projects, it is very easy to draw conclusions and blame the incapability and maybe also the lack of good intentions for it. But I wanted to apply systems thinking into this I wanted to analyze the system in more in depth to understand it and then move forward to make recommendations. As there are multiple agents who also interact with each other and who play a crucial role in the implementation of these projects, the issues that arose were wicked. In the morning, General Casey talked about a VUCA world. Indeed, the world and the systems in it are filled with volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Now, we can see that this system is a complex adaptive system, or a CAS. If you ask why, because they are harder to understand and build a mental model of. This is what makes it a complex adaptive system. That is its characteristics. Therefore, coming to the agent-based analysis approach, or the ABA approach, we know that it is an approach to systems understanding, problem-solving, analysis synthesis of various kinds that utilizes CAS perspective as a frame. This is why I use the ABA approach in particular for this analysis. Besides the ABA approach, there are other methods at hand also. One such method is the agent-based modeling approach or the ABM approach. But ABM approach might not be useful in all cases. This is because it requires a high level of specificity. So in a lot of cases, we couldn't come to construct the validity because of less information or technical issues. So now, as we see in the slide, the steps to an ABA approach includes two parts. The first one is understanding the system, and the second one is making recommendations. For the purpose of my analysis, I started with the fropping rule, which is the rule of framing and stopping. To narrow down my scope to look at only those projects which are classified as the national pride projects in Nepal. 
The national pride projects are most the infrastructure projects of the government of Nepal based upon the proposed proposal of the National Planning Commission, which have been initiated with the ambition of improving the social, economic, cultural, and environmental aspect of the general public. The first step to ABA approach is the DSRP analysis. While understanding the system, the DSRP method is used to establish distinctions, systems, relationships, and perspectives. This helps us understand the system on the basis of different agents, the relationships they have between them, their interaction with each other, and the perspectives they have towards each other. For my analysis, I initially sketched a basic DSRP map using the information found from the National Planning Commission's website and other publication and articles on the web. The initial map consisted of agents such as the government, the private sector, the judiciary, and the legal framework. But then I used the process of structural predictions. Structural predictions are a way to look at what more is missing in the map and then making a prediction of what more is there. During this step, I added the institutions who make the law, the community and the development partners in my DSRP map. With this, the map looked at the relationship between all these agents and the perspectives they had towards each other. Already with the map, I could navigate through some factors um, that may contributed, may have contributed to the issues in the implementation of the development projects. For an example, mostly, most of the legislations were firstly made at the federal and then at the provincial level. But a lot of work with regards to the projects were being done at the local levels. So if there wasn't a good communication of what's needed at the local level, the legislations made at the federal level could give rise to some issues. This was the benefit of the DSRP map. We could just take a step back and look at the whole system to see everything. So this is my full DSRP map. Now, neither do I want you to try to read this, nor I want you to try to understand this, but I just wanted to show you this because I wanted to tell you that it's hard to understand what's going on here, but that depicts how the system is. When I mapped the whole system, I came to a conclusion that dealing with these issues were more complicated because there were multiple agents involved. After the DSRP map, the next step is the positive analysis. This method helps us see what the system is currently doing. Positive means the purpose of a system is what it does. This is a systems thinking heuristic, which is coined by Stafford Peer. So it's not about what the system is meant to do, but about what the system is currently doing. But when we look at both these, we can find out the difference between them, which is our root difference analysis. So after the DSRP map, I did a positive analysis. This analysis extracted information from the DSRP map to highlight the problem statement, current positive, future positive, and the root difference between them. And this way, I could see the gap and get a grasp of what is going wrong. One problem statement as an example that I would give is about the complicated legal system creating obstacles for performance. Now here, the current positive was that the legal system is good at creating hurdles and obstacles to make it difficult to implement the development projects. This is because this is what the legal system was currently doing. The future positive, which is our aspirations or our desired goals, was that the laws were facilitating for the implementation of the development projects. And when we did a root difference analysis between these two, the root difference between them were the legal systems were policing in the current positive, but it was facilitating in the future positive. The laws were contradicting each other in the current positive, but the laws were complementing each other in the future positive. The main emphasis on, was on fulfilling the requirements in the current positive. The main emphasis on, was on the goals in the future positive. After understanding the system in this way, the next part is in relation to making recommendations. But before that, the CAS analysis helps us see if the agents are following the simple rules as part of the CAS principles, which helps us develop the recommendations rubrics. In the CAS analysis, I first listed the salient agents, their simple rules, which is basically their behavior or what they simply do. And at last, the current system level behavior. The system level behavior is built with salient agents behaving in the way they do or following their simple rules. I noted five salient agents in my systems, different levels of governments, different institutions that make the legislations, 
such as the House of Representatives and the National Assembly, different courts in Nepal, the community, and the private sector. To give you an example of a simple rule, the court's simple rule would be to overturn any decision that conflicts with the law. Now, suppose the court here is our salient agent. This simple rule of a salient agent brings out a system level behavior of government decisions to fast track project being overturned because of no legal basis. When we have all these information, we can build our recommendations rubrics and they then make our recommendations. The recommendations rubrics are like a litmus test through which the recommendations we make should pass as it eliminates all recommendations which do not contribute to the desired possible and are not implementable. My rubrics included criteria of the focus needing to be on systemic, institutional, and procedural change, not excluding any stakeholders' perspectives, offering management solutions and not being biased, bringing the desired results, and being able to be further modified with time. With this, the last part of this analysis, I came to the recommendations with regards to these four areas. The community which resides around the development projects needs to be made part of the planning process from the get-go. Some of the laws are simply discouraging efficient work. They need to be amended. The process of selection and handing contracts should be made even more transparent. And at last, we should learn from our mistake. Let the evidence guide us, not, guiding, not us guiding the evidence. An evidence-based approach should be followed. With this, my ABA analysis was completed. Again, ABA approach is based on the underlying structure of CAS, which tells us that different independent agents with their own local super rule brings out collective dynamics resulting in emergent behaviors or properties of a system. <clears throat> While ending my presentation, I would like to encourage that all of us who are looking to solve the problems in the world, big or small, need to change the way in which we think about them. Now, I would like to conclude with this quote from Einstein, and it goes like, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used to create them. Thank you for listening to my presentation. That's it for Nepal for today. Now I'd like to hand it over to Angel for the next presentation. Thank you so much, Ishan, and thank you so much, Ben and Laura, for the introduction. And okay, let me share my screen. Okay, hello all. My name is Angel. Um, this is a very personal topic for me. First. Um, the Missing Mismatch, a case study of Panama's public security systems issues using the agent-based approach. Um, I'm a Cornell student, uh, but first um, I'm from Panama and I want to see my country better. So this is why I'm doing this. And I believe that the younger people should be involved into policy areas to try to solve the issues that are the ones that are making us live lives difficult in our countries. Um, and second, this is also a, a personal topic for me because I worked for the Ministry of Public Security of Panama for a couple of years. So I have some knowledge coming to this presentation about this topic, and I wanted to share with you. This is very specific to Panama in a context. Uh, however, I believe that the issues I'm going to be talking are the, can, they can be um, trans, transferred in the knowledge and the learning to different countries in the region that are experience, experimenting this same issues related to public security systems. Okay, first thing first, let's talk about the context of Panama. Panama is a very cute country that I really like. Uh, we have a geographic uh, position that is very privileged in the middle of the continent of America. Uh, we have two borders, one with Costa Rica and the other with Colombia. And we have huge coasts, one with the Caribbean Sea in the north and with the Pacific Ocean in the south. Um, and historically has been a place of, of use for road of transit of people, merchandise, and even animals at the, at the very beginning. So that geographic position is one of our main strengths because also we have uh, uh, the Panama Canal in that, in that specific location, which also brings us to the booming economy in our country. We use the dollar in Panama, the US dollar, and we have a very strong service sector 
with um, the strong also banking and financing services, tourism, and obviously the Panama Canal contributing to a total of $66 billion annually in our gross domestic product, uh, which is huge for the amount of population in our country, which is only 4.2 million people, which is why then after discovering this, however, there is also another topic that we need to discuss is that this economy may not be it may not be distributed equally to the people in my country. So there is high levels of income inequality. We are ranked the third in the region of income inequality according to the Gini index. And we have struggles on the unemployment rates, including uh, evidently the, 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 the relationships of the unemployment in the country and the, and the unemployment rates on, of the of the young population, which is um, because of the COVID sadly has been increasing. And also there is a, a, a percentage rate of right now between 11 to 15% of unemployment. And from that percentage, 30% of unemployment is from the young population of my country from 20 to 20 to 24 years old. This young population in vulnerability is the ones that the local gangs are taking advantage of because there's people that doesn't have opportunities of employment or to sustain their families. So the local gangs that work as, as the inroads of the, criminal, of the criminal organizations, transnational organizations in the regions, take advantage of these people, recruit this young population, and they are the, the part of the weakness of our country, but also parts of the opportunities of our country because this is our this is population that is in a, in, a, in a stage of their lives that they can be working. So if I wanted to just show you a SWOT analysis with what is, a, what is the strengths of my country, what are the weaknesses of the country, of the country, what are the threats and the opportunities, I will finish right here. However, we have to be a little more deep. The AVA is that framework that um, the, the presentation from this morning actually and, and Andrew were telling before, these frameworks that we use to develop policies should, be, should go a little deeper to understand the systems rather than just doing a classic sort analysis that I could just end my presentation right here and that's not what we want. Okay, then let's talk more about who is in charge of the public security in my country. The Ministry of Public Security, according to the law 15 of 2010, is a main um, agent of the system of public security in Panama. This is the main building is in Nacon, and I were there, so it brings me memories. Um, and that's and in its operational level, we have the security services of the country. We don't in Panama we don't have uh, military. Uh, we don't have an army. So what we have is law enforcement law enforcement services. We have the national police. We have the Air and Naval Operations Service, we have the Border Control Service, and the Migration Service, and all of them work in the operational level of the Ministry of Public Security. And all of them operate in a way that they have crime statistics to kind of measure how, what they are doing, how they are going with the homicides, and how they are like trying to perceive the, their, their success or not. However, that is in um, doing the research in this ex in, in, for this topic. There is other information that we need to offer to understand the system and the context of, of Panama. And is that we have many reports of crimes that are not being reported. The European Union and the UNODC you know, did a report in 2017 saying that there is annually a, around 637,000 crimes committed in Panama. And the bribery, thefts, and scams could be 100 times more than what the Ministry of Public Security have as the statistics for my country. And so those are the statistics that they are using to manage all of their operations. However, this report and many other information shows, okay, there is more than what the authorities are saying. So then I use, use system thinking and the ABA approach. Why the ABA approach and not ABM? Well, because as we discussed in the morning with, when Laura was explaining it before, the, ABA, the ABM would require us to have a codification of what is of, of all the elements of the system so we can model them. And as you can imagine, 
a security system in Panama and in any other country will not be as easy to model because there are so many agents involved, so many perspectives and so many relationships. So this is where system thinking and the ABA comes. This is an agent based approach that is able to participate in this VUCA world like the first presentation in the morning with General Casey was saying, this is a VUCA world what we're talking to. And this is a CAS, the CAS of the, of the system, the complex adaptive system of the security system of Panama. So when we map the system, we discovered and, and, and after several iterations of research, that there are, main, there are eight main agents in the system of security in my country with 12 main relationships and two principal perspectives. This, what I'm showing you right now in the, in, the, in the slide is one part of my map that I don't pretend you to be like understanding all of that, but I want to show you that using the Plectica sub, software map, mapping system, map, mapping software, I was, used, um, I was able to develop this system and map what I'm talking about. And then using the policy, we, the, the, then this, the ABA requires us to try to see, okay, what is the purpose of the system? So we, can, so we can see actually in reality, what is the behavior of this system? And the Panama's public security system, sadly, is extremely helpful in raising the number of homicide, thefts, armed robbery, and several other crimes in the country. And I'm not saying this uh, out of just dislike or, or, or because people will say, okay, but why are you talking this about this about your own country? I'm talking like this with this reality about my own country because I want it better. And if I wanted to improve it, I wanted to, I, I need to be, I need to fall in love with reality like that I was saying yesterday. And I need to be raw about what is happening with my country so we can have a starting line that can be beneficial for everybody. So what's happening after I discovered every part of my system, what is happening is that, is that the authorities and the security services are measuring, are measuring their success. And they do annual memories uh, saying how many tons of drugs they have seized, say they have seized uh, and they say, okay, they, I have this, this year where 72 tons of drugs and then 90 tons of drugs. And those are big amounts of drugs because we have to understand that Panama as a connection point and a, a geographic position, as I was telling before, is a, is a location that is used um, from South America to, to, to traffic drugs to North America and to, and to Europe. So the, there is a lot of tons that are tons of drugs that are seized but they also use other statistics. They use crimes and statistics of homicides and the reported crimes that make in comparison to what we, that, what we showed you before is that there are crimes that are also not being reported. However, how is the population measuring the, the security system in the country? They are using the newspapers. They are, using, they are using social media. They're using the communication they have with people in the family of how was it the way, how, how was it your walk to home? How it was safe? How, are, are, you, are you with your family? Are, we, are you with friends? Are you walking alone? And they, that's a way that they're measuring uh, the security in the country. And sadly, well, you see these different main pages in newspapers showing horrible crimes. So there is a huge mismatch here. And this is the main understanding. And that's why that, that topic, that the title of my research is called The Missing Mismatch. There is a disparity here in what the authorities, the authorities are thinking, how they are measuring their, 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 their strategies and policies to fight crime, and how the population are measuring the insecurity in the country. This mismatch is the key in the system and it's a key for everybody in the system. So I went a little further and I say, okay, what are the causes of this mismatch? And I developed as the three main causes, in my opinion, that are the causes of this mismatch. First, there is an unprepared leadership that lacks capacity and lacks resources. And I will not say every part of the leadership because I believe there is a there is huge amount of prepared and, and, and the people with capacity in our security services. However, the leadership that comes from the political appointees above them, because these, the law enforcement services in my, in my country are below, the civil society, they lack uh, the, the capacity and the resources to offer leadership that is strong and has to go forward like General Casey was it saying in the morning. Then inefficient public administration, there is, that's also a cause of the, of the mismatch. The corruption and lack of transparency. There was a report from the US State of Department saying about how there is a lack of transparency from the uh, authorities in Panama to say how many 
people from the security services are like those like uh, uh, bad apples that are cooperating or even from the political appointees that are made cooperating with the local gangs and the transnational criminal organizations. So that's corruption is also an important factor. And then the political reasons, the political appointees with short-sighted mentality and lack of self-critical analysis that only think about themselves. So then we have solutions that we can offer also for this mismatch. Honest a self-critical leadership, that's a first, that's a must. Strategies and policies that rely on data and evidence, that's also a must. And prepare public administrators that put the interests of the nation above their own. This is difficult, but it's one of the most important things that we need to solve, that we need to solve our, our system issues in Panama. So then remembering now what we did as a policy with, what we have as a policy with, the purpose of the system is what it does, the public security in Panama, then we have, we, 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 after understanding the system, we also have a desire possible, one by which the authorities reflect interest in fighting crime in all its stages, prevention, repression, and resocialization through a coordinated effort among institutions other than the security services, counting with a strong judicial system and with detailed public security national strategy that can transcend one government administration to the next one. After doing all my analysis and my system, then I can offer these main recommendations that are agent-based recommendations. The first recommendation is that there's, there should be a national public security strategy with emphasis on prevention, with better technology and judicial efficiency for re the repression side, and better programs of resocialization. The plan should be integral. So what are the agents that should be in charge of these recommendations? Well, then, obviously, first, a Ministry of Public Security that should be in all of these recommendations. But the judicial system for the, for the judicial um, reforms and the National Assembly for those reforms, too. So then the, but better, the second recommendation would be better collaboration among institutions. There were a lot of issues in the system when I mapped it about the relationship with other institutions, because heavily the security system is heavily charged only on the Ministry of Public Security. However, they are not the only ones in charge of prevention. The Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Social Development, the Ministry of Culture, they all should step up to the game and try to help the country in preventing crime. Then also, and lastly, the relevance and maintenance of strategies and goals, no matter the political party and in government. So, because the prevention is not something that will, that will occur from one night to the other. And it, was, and it will not be solved, the crime, the crime issues and the security system issues. It's a wicked problem. This will not be solved from one in, in one single government. So we also need political authorities and the population that elect these political authorities that is voting for people that really wants to solve these issues, no matter what they are gaining or not in the process, because this is bigger than them. This is bigger than any political elected official. Uh, Thank you for the presentation. I'm on, for for, the, for your for your time listening to my presentation. I'm offering only uh, this huge map of what I was doing before uh, with all my analysis and all the recommendations and all my parts. So you can see where where I'm coming from. And I did this after at least five or or six iteration processes, asking for people feedback and also doing a little research. Thank you so much. And Ben, now back to you for the moderation. Wow. Thank you, Sean Angel. That's phenomenal. That's the next president of Panama, everyone. Um, that was that was really great. I think, I mean, it's just, it's so exciting. I, I, I said this in the last panel, but just as another student to see what you two have done is really, it's really exceptional. I think as much as I want to kind of continue on Hell's energy right now, there's, there's a piece of a Sean's presentation that really is just sticking with me that I feel like we have to address, or at least I have to. Um, and you mentioned a project that took 32, 33 years. Is that, is that right? Was that one project that was that long to completion? It was 23 years. I mean, to me, I find that, I find that shocking. I think, you know, you, you mentioned the whole phenomenon is, is astonishing and I 100% I agree, but I, to me, it, it speaks to it. This must be a sort of known problem, a known quantity in Nepal. And I'm curious if there are any, you know, programs, projects in place right now that are working to fix this and why, why you think it's such a persistent problem. 
I think there are efforts in this time and again, but like I think the main question over here is if whether those efforts are directed at the right place. So if the efforts are like fakely defined and it goes around the main issue, I think that wouldn't bring the solution that we were looking for. And that's why I think the application of systems thinking would be really helpful in this, because when we map the whole system, we could actually see where the issues are, where the problems are, and we could actually provide a diagnosis for that specific place where the problem is. But right now it's like, there are efforts time and again, and there are remedies that are provided, but like, it's not really addressing the core need, the need of the day kind of a problem and issue. So a case of, of Einstein's, you know, using the same thinking to solve that we that we use to create the problems is that kind of what we're looking at a sort of self reinforcing loop that would you characterize it that way i think it's definitely a case of uh, that and also it's also a case of not thinking this problem in depth so i think it's also easy to get lost in the everyday kind of a task so when you don't see that system and don't don't analyze it on the basis of you know, taking that big picture look, it's really difficult to sort of see the bits and pieces and sort of see where the problems and issues are. So definitely a case of that as well. It makes an unfortunate amount of sense, I have to say. And I, you know, I have, I think a similar question for Angel. I mean, this to me strikes me as, you know, you pulled up a number of news clippings that show headlines that seem to really draw attention to this. Um, and obviously you talked about this, maybe this is really the fundamental crux of your argument even. Um, but I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about sort of what's what's the basis for this being becoming or being such an entrenched issue um, and sort of what efforts are being made to sort of, you know, that specifically target that perspective of, you know, the statistics in particular or, you know, what practical, what are the practitioners in Panama doing to address this issue? Or is it, and I'm sorry to, to jump in again, but is it a question of maybe they don't even see they don't even see what's going on. Yeah, there is a, thank you Ben for the question. Um, there is a particular situation here is that um, if, yeah, I will not, let, let's, let's be also honest and, and, and fall in love with reality. We, there is efforts that these security services are doing. They, I will not deny that. There are efforts like they are doing some sports leaks uh, for the, the, the prevention, in the prevention part of the of the of, of, of this of the strategy to fight crime however they're like cutting short they are heavily focusing on the repression side uh however there is no cooperation that that really involves reforms in the judicial system so this repression can can be more just like increasing the the prison like the the, the, the prison years um I will say that despite those efforts, there is not like an integral strategy that really is going to last longer than one government. Sadly, there is um, this bad habit of saying, okay, whenever uh, there is a new government entering the, it, with all of their political appointees, uh okay we don't want anything that was discussed in the previous government so let's trash all of that and then let's change all of the police police officials police officials and commanders in charge because we don't want any any queue so let's let's just take them out and do a new fresh board of of, of police people in that in charge so every time it's like a new constant starting fresh and and that's not any we are not going anywhere in that in that scenario uh and I will also like I will also try to make an emphasis here in the perspective side, which is why I I, I, I went down so much in that part and why the title of of, the, of my research is mis the missing mismatch is a part of the perspectives. Uh, if they are not receiving the feedback, if they are not understanding that the perspectives that of how they're measuring success is different from how the population measures success. Because either they feel that they are that that if they do accept that they may be weak, or if they do accept that that's like a political loose, or if they do accept that then they 
some people will like take advantage of that and, and, and talk something about them. If they don't do that just because of any of those of these fears, then they are not really adjusting their strategies and their policies. And they are not really understanding that they can listen to feedback from the population and adjust as what Dan was saying before with the ST loop magic, which, because it's a magic, you adjust from the feedback. And after that, there is also, if, you, if the population feels that the feedback that they are offering is well received by the, by the government, and it's not coming from critiques in social media, but actually like honest self-critique leadership that is accepting this feedback and trying to adjust, then the population will be a little more willing to offer some collaboration in fighting the crime in the communities. And they will also be willing to give information and tips to the security services so they can offer better strategies, better operations in those communities that are having a kind of distrust of the security services because they may be all thinking that some, some officials are corrupt, so I don't believe in them. And the other people are the criminals, so I don't want them either. And there is no collaboration among the population and the security service. They need to fall in love with reality. They need to fall in love with the feedback. And they need to appreciate that, re that reality so they can adjust that strategies. And that's going to be also coming for, uh, help, helping them in the long run. So this also, you know, it, it brings up a question that I asked for the last panel that to me is really one of the central pieces of ABA and systems thinking and metacognition more broadly, which is <clears throat> an issue like this that is so, so personal for you, right? You mentioned, you know, sort of one of the first couple sentences was that this is a very personal issue. Um, I was hoping you could talk just a little bit about how metacognition, how ABA, ST loop, whatever tools you think were most important. But if you could just talk a little bit about how those tools helped you sort of recognize and mitigate your own bias and how that sort of brought you through on this analysis. Yes, um, thank you for that question. I, I will also have to say that uh, I am very thankful that I understood this through the Cabreras when they were teaching the class because I also recognize my own bias uh, in the first, in the very first part of the of the of of of, of the of the understanding of how system thinking works, and I also kind of saw how bringing my own background into this and my own personal knowledge about this can bias the understanding of the system. So what I wanted to do, what I did, is that I first mapped my system with the knowledge that I had. And then I started having what in system thinking and then this approach is uh, the structural predictions that some of the, of the fellows have told before and how some parts of my system were getting a little, okay, if I have this information of this agent collaborating with other um, or, or these agents like the security services are part of the Ministry of Public Security, how they really relate them on each other. Are these security services having any influence in the judicial system? Or, or vice versa, or with the public ministry, or with them, or with a prison system. So I really was like trying to move, trying to trying to get out of my comfort zone of my own knowledge, of my own expertise about this topic to understand better the, the, the system. With that, with this idea of okay, let's start to understand the system first. Let's not solve it because if I am I have that idea of solving the system or solving the issue, then I will have a bias because I will only be looking in that direction. But I was trying to understand the system first, and that's a very basic recommendation that I will give anybody that is doing this. Try to understand the system first without any understanding or without aiming to any solution. Try to understand it first. What are, what, what are the distinctions that you are making? The DSRP process. What are the distinctions that you are making? What are the parts? Uh, what are the holes? What are the relationships among them? Is any relationship having a reaction back? Is any action having a reaction? What are the perspectives involved? And once I did that, then I discovered that even my knowledge was a little, uh, even small in comparison to what I learned after that. And I will continue, and I will continue learning. What I love about the mapping and, and, and system thinking is that this is not a process that I will say now, okay, now I am the one that knows the most about system security in Panama, and I can say anything to anyone about this. No, this is, a, this is something that needs to be adjusted through feedback. And I will do that, uh, and I will encourage everybody to do that in any system that you are experiencing, any system that you are learning. You are going to do that, and you are going to try to find information, try, find in, uh, insights that you didn't have before using this, using this tool. 
that's that's phenomenal. I, I mean, I think it, that is really the the most important piece. It sounds like is is just understanding and starting there. But Ishan, I'm curious if that is sort of also your takeaway from this process, and maybe if you could you know talk a little bit about your background and how that shaped your analysis. Um, maybe if there's similar similar issues at play or, or how that worked how that worked for you what information did you bring to this analysis sort of out of the gate i mean the problems that i noted were the problems that we face we used to face in the day to day life but i definitely would not say that i have like substantial expertise towards it however i i also had some exposure towards it in different forms so I had the information and also in the past, I got like plenty of opportunities to interact with policymakers and get a good insight into this. But again, I'm also part of the general public. So, you know, the other side of the coin. So I had that opposing sort of review as well. I would say all this informed my initial hypothesis and understanding of the change. But while I was doing this analysis, I was careful not to be swung by my bias. But again, you know, the systems thinking process, right from starting from the DSRP mapping and then doing the structural predictions and the SD loop feedback, I think it helped me really get distant from my biases. Now, I think like, would I be worried about my bias if I just like made an assumption and made recommendations? I guess I would in that case, but would I be worried if I applied sort of the structure of systems thinking? maybe not in that case because like I, I don't know how you know i would be able to like put in my bias throughout the structure so it's kind of like following the structure and it's really helped me like sort of move away from my bias um regarding metacognition i'm also like super careful when i you know make assumptions and write down certain certain things but again when i went through the structural prediction then i again talked to a few people then i referred to a lot of other people and a lot of other papers that were written there. So I think that also sort of like modified my initial assumptions. And, you know, even though I might have had certain biases in the start, I think at the end, what I wrote down were like kind of like distant from those initial biases. That, that's, I, it's, it's great to hear you guys talk about this because it's, it's really is nice to see that sort of um, and this was just mentioned in the chat, but the, the kind of paradox between how do we address questions um, and issues and systems that are both close to us, um, and how do we how do we channel that you know our exposure, our awareness of those issues, and and put it to good use. Um, but I'm going to turn my attention a little bit more to the the Q and A. Um, there's a lot of questions sort of flooding um, that is starting. To move fairly quickly so if i don't get to your question i apologize um, but i will do my best the first one that came up um, that i'm i'm actually curious myself about is um it's noted that the the pictures and particularly i noticed the picture of um, the ministry of De public security officials with the confiscated drugs um, to to this audience i think they look an awful lot like an army and I'm curious if you could elaborate a little bit on the distinction there and if that's relevant for your thinking about the system or if that's just a, you know, a, maybe a red herring. Yeah, I will say that is, um, is part of the, of the culture, I will say it is, um, it is not properly part of, of what it should be understood from, understood from the system. There is a heavily uh, kind of fear in the population of Panama of the militarization of the police, which is completely understandable after the dictatorship period in Panama that ended in 1989 with the US invasion of Panama and the, the take out of the dictator Noriega. So it was, uh, it is, it is, see, yeah, it is, there is like this fear in the environment of Panama that there should not be any militarization of the police. Um, however, the, the the political and the lack of the political appointees and the, and the elected officials and their lack of preparation normally increase the repression side of 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 fighting crime, and the repression side is mostly giving um, the the, service, the security services uh, a lot of the resources that they need, including uh, better 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 equipment, better vehicles, better 
um, technology, which is not a bad thing, but it, it looks like a little more like heavy militarized for the, from the picture, which is uh, there are sectors of the, of, the, of the population that are critics of that participate par, par, particular uh, scenario, scenario or topic. However, it is as, as, out of, out of, as of today, after 30 years of democratic transitions in different from government to government, it I will say it is not a, an alarming situation. It is not something that that should brings alarms beyond the the repression that that because it, it is almost the only thing that the political say okay let's fight crime and let's be repress let, let's repress crime with whatever opportunities they have. But there is like this these manifestations and protests where the the police that are not trained to deal with multitudes because they are more trained to deal with these local guns. They are the ones sent to deal with these multitudes uh, uh, that are just making any, a manifestation for some rights, you know, for some salaries or whatever. So those, those are the moments where the security system and the, and the level of militarization that they are experiencing, that they're experiencing are, are actually kind of affecting the system in some points, but that's in the repression side. And that's not really, um, and, and it may take some participation, but it's not really taking all of the system uh, as it is as of right now. If I will say to you, well, we had an, an attempt of a queue the la in the last period of election, election period for president, then I will say to you, then this militarization is an issue. But right now, thankfully, we don't have that. Thank you, Angel. So I'm going to do my best to combine two questions in the chat since um, we don't have a huge amount of time to address these. but um the, the question of both politics and corruption were raised for, regarding both of you so i'm curious to know how much that played a role in your analysis is is mitigating or understanding the political elements here and any potential implication of corruption or concrete existence of it's hard to know um, but did that play a role in your analysis and, and how did you how did you think about those issues? Um, and I think we'll start start with Ashan. So so when I did my DSRP map, um, I could see the relationships between different agents. So you know the governments, different level of governments, whether that's the local level, whether that's the provincial level or whether that's the federal level. Then th there are lawmakers as well, policymakers who are part of the National Assembly, who are part of the House of Representatives. So all of these had certain relationships with the private sector or the private sector agencies as well. There were also relationships with the judiciary. So when you talk about things like corruption, I guess like even if it's not there explicitly, I mean, it's there. Sometimes it's there explicitly, sometimes it's there implicitly. So when you look at these relationships, a lot of private sector companies might be lobbying for their interest, which might not be the interest of the general public, but then they might go and lobby to the policymakers who might actually make law for it. Now, as I noted in my presentation, one of the salient agents, if we suppose that the courts are the salient agents, then their simple rule is to overturn any decisions that are not as per the law of the day. So when you see that, and when the policymakers make laws which do not benefit the society, but benefit the private entities, and if someone comes up and does something that is opposite of that, or something that benefits the society, the court would overturn it either way, because that's not as per the legal foundation or the legal framework of the day. So you know, you see that corruption, how that plays into the system, and it becomes a systemic issue. So it's not just about you know someone coming up and giving bribes. That's a very straightforward way to see this. But the system's thinking, I think we can just move a step forward and see these kind of structural issues in the whole system. And there are plenty of other issues. So also, if you see the relationship between the private companies and the private associations, so in my map, there's a section of private entities, which has both the private companies and also the private associations. So in, in Nepal, the private associations are big, but there is this another dynamics into that as well. So the private companies have certain interest in general, but the private associations do not lobby for that interest. Now there is this another dynamics that comes into play 
that is that the associations of private companies are also sort of in a way now i might use this word but like let me say captured by certain households or certain businesses and they lobby for their own particular interest and again not for the interest of the overall private sector so in a way that's also corrupting the system and that's bringing out laws which again comes to the play of like the supreme court or the courts of nepal which overturn it if you know like decisions even if they benefit the general public so that's that's how i see corruption and it's not just about bribes but it's about engraving the corruption into the system and making it a systemic or structural issues in the system that that is fantastic and on hell i'm sorry we're actually we've run over by a minute or two so i am afraid we don't have time for you to answer that but i did just want to close by again reiterating you know how grateful we all are for having you how how nice it is to listen to you and how interesting those topics are we're just really can't say enough how how much we appreciate you being here so thank you both